said that the weights are IID. IID. Okay. And um, uh, now you can consider the so-called natural extension of the set of results um, uh, to weights that are merely stationary. Meaning, um, if, if I look at the weights at some point, say rooted at X in the lattice, and I look at the collection of weights in some box at some point Y, then these have the same distribution of weights. And then, so uh, my space would be omega um, of positive real numbers representing the weights to the ZD. And my measure will be invariant under translations of ZD. Translations. And in fact, I'll also assume that it's ergodic. And if you don't know what that means, it doesn't matter for now. So originally we had considered the case where P was um, ZD, like that, a product measure or IID measure. But now um, I, I want to consider general P and see what we can say about the limit shapes in this case. Okay, so this is my fifth and final classical result about um, uh, percolation about the time constant at least. So uh, there's a famous theorem due to Hagstrom and Meister which says the following. Hagstrom, Meister, 1995, and the probability, which says given some convex shape, um, that's compact and symmetric. Symmetric, meaning if X is in the shape C, then minus X is also in the shape C. And also suppose it has non-empty interior, non-trivial. And suppose it's non-trivial. Then there exists P or a stationary distribution of weights, um, FPP model, whose time constant is C. Okay, so that's pretty crazy in the sense that any general shape can be achieved as the time constant. So, for example, if I took a polygon like that, then there's some distribution that achieves this shape. If I took the L1 norm, there's some distribution we already know. But suppose if we took something like the LP norm, like some LP norm. In fact, any convex shape can be achieved by these stationary systems. What is it? I is known to this. What do I mean? What? Suppose I is non-trivial. Oh, I is uh, a shape. Is a shape should have non-empty interior. That's what you mean, right? Yeah, and yeah, right. It has, it has non-empty interior. Because you could have some line or something like that too, right? So that would also be convex and compact and symmetric. So is this a constructive result or is this really it's constructive. Constructive. It's a constructive result. Um yes, yes. It doesn't make a huge difference in this case because I think it can be made to work, but where E of ZD, just the edges of the light. Um, so it's constructive, and moreover, this P is uh, very random in the sense that 
it's a factor of a Bernoulli shift. A Bernoulli shift. And so it has positive entropy, it's mixing and th stuff like that. So it's, um, which implies mixing, positive entropy, and so on. What do you mean by time constant, sir? You didn't introduce that. Uh, yeah, okay. So let me just remind you of the, um, the notation. So just give me one second. Is that the mu? That's the mu. So I'll, I'll just write down the notation again. Uh, would it help if I put down the notation there on the board? Yeah, for the audience. Just for the online audience. Um, yeah, I'll write it down. Yeah. So um, Pxy was my passage time. Uh, mu of x was my average passage time in direction x. T0 and x divided by n. And we call this the time constant. And then B was the level set of the time constant. Mu of x less than or equal to 1. And we call this the um, uh, limit shape. Okay. Okay, so what this theorem is saying is that any B or any C any C can be achieved as a limit shape B. All other things um, work the same way, the subadditive ergodic theorem applies and, and so on and so forth. What is it for the circle? What is it for the circle? Um, it's <laughs> it, it is a bit complicated to describe. Let me try to describe it. So in all these sort of ergodic things, you can build some measure and sort of stationarize. It. And so you build this measure in some way that it's some function of some Bernoulli random variable. So it will have nice mixing properties and so on. So what you do is you take the circle and you take some dense set of points on the circle and then you make these long super highways going off in each of these dense points. And then you sort of uh, sprinkle these super highways in a particular direction in various points of the line. Yeah, is there a question? Should, oh, should I, re I should repeat the, uh, I should repeat Arvind's question, right? Maybe it's better to use. Um, Can you repeat the question? Okay, okay, maybe turn up your volume. Ah, yeah, yeah. Sorry. Repeat the question now. Hello. Was there a question? No, I said I can estimate what the question is, so it's OK. From the answer, I can estimate, so that's fine. Uh, so uh, so can, the question then. Maybe you can just repeat Alvin's question. You are muted. We can't hear you. Uh, you're muted. Yeah, thanks. And so then you sprinkle these super highways. So there's this uh, echo on you. So you sprinkle these super highways um, going off in each direction. And um, you sprinkle them in so that they appear very often on the lattice. And once you do this, um, if you want to go off in some particular direction, you find um, some superhighway. It will be order one away from you. And then you take that superhighway and go off in that direction. And because all directions are equally likely in this construction, 
um, you, the limit shape will be a circle. It's, it's a little complicated to explain, but that's the intuition. Yeah, yeah. So in the sense that you can imagine the field to be generated by your, your probability space can be zeros and ones. Yeah. Um, but um, it's better to and then you actually have real valued weights from somehow. Uh, uh, so Nishant asks, can you make this measure a Markov random field or a Gibbs measure? Uh, that is sort of, you know, if you want to sample the geodesic uh, on a box, then you would uh, uh, you condition on what is outside uh, and then you can read something again. It would sort of redraw. That would probably be hard. Yeah. So Nishant says, uh, I have no answer. I don't know. Uh, these measures that are constructed are very far from it, for sure. OK, so now I want to move on to geodesics. So a geodesic is a path that minimizes the passage time between in uh, convex shapes only ones that you can get to? Uh, yes. So Rajesh asks, are uh, convex shapes the only ones you can get um, in first passage percolation? Uh, the answer is yes, because uh, the convexity is inherited from the triangle inequality for the metric. So um, a, a geodesic is a path that minimizes uh, passage time between any two points on it. The path that minimizes t x y, uh, uh, and I'll say geodesic x from x to y is a self-avoiding geodesic with maximal number of edges. So what does this mean? I have two points X and Y. I could have geodesics of two different Euclidean lengths, different numbers of edges, gamma one, gamma two. And then geodesic upper bar over line would be gamma two in this case, would be, um, would pick gamma two in this case. Similarly, you can also define geo x y but um, it has the minimal number of edges Uh, loops could have zero weight, so right. Just also want to introduce some more notation. So if I say geodesic X, then this implies it's an infinite geodesic starting at X, meaning it just starts at some point X and goes off um, and it has um, infinitely many um, edges on it. And we will mostly care about these. So this will be my focus in the next talk.
but on the finite scale is where you see these connections to um, uh, the KPZ growth class. So I'll talk about those just in the interest of completeness. So um, I'll say an infinite geodesic has direction, uh, say theta. Um, if um, so, let me write it this way. I'll say um, let um, geo x be written as x equals x naught x1. So these are the vertices it encounters on the lattice. Then I'll write the direction of this geodesic as limit xi if it exists, if the limit exists. Uh, sorry, that should be x sub i. Okay. Then for these infinite geodesics, I will say geodesic x is the same as geodesic y if they only differ uh, on finitely num or many edges, meaning I have, they'll start off at two different points, they'll go off for a while, and if they coalesce and they stay together forever, these two geodesics are the same for me in the infinite geodesics. Geodesic y, if they uh, differ only on finitely many edges. Okay, so the most basic questions we can ask are It's just a point in ZD. And geo x is one particular geodesic starting to There can be multiple. They, they, there can be multiple. Open question proof there are infinitely many. Starting from any point. So most things are open in this in this field. So uh when you say that the uh, IID, IID, typically IID, yeah, open. What we have, I'll, I'll mention these results in a bit. So, Nishant was asking, um, what do you mean by geodesic X? And I said that um, um, just just some geodesic starting from the point X, and he asked, um, uh, there could be infinitely many, um, and I mentioned that this was, in fact, open to show that there are infinitely many infinite geodesics um, starting from any any set of points on on the lattice. Okay. So when you so say infinite many, is access, sorry, uh, can you hear me? Um, so in D equals two, finite geodesics exist. This period, any distribution IID, they exist. In higher D, if in D bigger than two, oops, I don't know what happened. Uh, maybe my thing crashed. Sorry. Yeah. Yeah, thankfully it has uh, saved it. Um, back. So, uh, Arjun, so we know it if F zero is is less than P C. This is the critical probability for percolation. And so on. In fact, it's open to show in D bigger than two, um, show that uh, you always have finite geodesics. Even that's open for IID distributions. So when you say finite, arbitrarily long, you mean? Arbitrarily long. Between two points, X and so. Oh, uh, yeah. So the question is, to be more precise, 
what is this existence question? Fix two points x comma y in z d um, arbitrary i i d uh, distribution show there exists uh, a geodesic between x and y. Okay, so okay so okay so let me go back and say um uh, sarvan is asking what is an infinite geodesic so uh, a geodesic is a path that minimizes the passage time between any two points on it an infinite geodesic is just an inf a path that starts at x and has in and encounters a self-avoiding path that starts at x and has that has infinitely many edges on it. So there is no minimizing. It does, it does. It's a geodesic. But what is it? it minimizes the passage time between any two points on it. Uh, so you call any path finite or infinite a geodesic if it minimizes passage time between any two points on it. So an infinite geodesic is an infinite path. Infinite. So then from this point of view. That's a good question. I'll address that in a second. So Arvind asks, it's not even clear that infinite geodesics exist, and I'll address that in a second. So in your existence, uh, you were talking about uh, finite geodesics existing. Does yes. It mean that there exists some geodesic path which is a cycle? Or, uh, uh, what do you mean by uh, so um, I, let me so Nishant's asking what I mean it, this this finite geodesic existence seems trivial. Exist anyway. uh, uh, Nishant saying finite geodesic should always exist. That's right, but under if if there are no zeros, then uh, finite geodesics you can somehow control. If the weight zero is never taken, because what happens if you have zeros is that there's this uh, this possibility. That you keep, you can keep going farther and farther away on these big loops of zeros. So the infimum is actually taken at infinity, at some path at infinity, so to speak. It's a sequence of paths that achieve the infimum in, instead of finding a uh, minimizing path. And so, ah, okay. So, so could I imagine something like this? Uh, I'm on this uh, loop state, and as I go longer the mass of the loop is becoming smaller and smaller. Right. The only one which is... I think I understand. Uh, and so that's why I mentioned if F0 is less than PC, there are no, there are not enough zeros, then this is a result due to Kessler. In fact, this condition is so important that there's a fundamental lemma, yeah? There's a le fundamental lemma due to Keston. This is Keston 86. He says, if F0 less than PC, then geodesics grow at most li li uh, linear. Uh, rather, let me write it this way. So, geo x comma y is less than or equal to c x minus y um, for um, x minus y large enough as is with high probability i'll say overwhelming uh, meaning the complement of this event is exponential in um, norm x minus y Yes, if F0 is equal to 0, then you can prove that uh, geodesics always exist. But the conjecture is that ge finite geodesics exist 
under no conditions on, on f because it's true in d equals to or construct a counter example. Okay, so the special case that we care about most is when f has continuous distribution. So in this case, geo xy equals geo under under bar xy and um, existence is given given by previous and this part of course is uh, unique. There are unique geodesics between any two points. In this case, one of the main open questions is the following. It says, um, show that limit n going to infinity of geo, um, say, 0 to n, 0 to nx divided by n exists. Okay. So, Keston showed that they can be at most linearly many edges in the geodesic. It's open to show that there's an actual limit, an asymptotic growth rate for the number of edges in a geodesic. This depends on x. Uh, could depend on x, yes. Very likely it depends on x because the time constant itself does. Uh, depends on x in the sense, depends on the direction, obviously. Yeah. So as you can see, I have very few answers and mostly only questions. Okay. So um, I was tempted to tell you about um, a little bit about how you prove limits of um, geodesics exist and um, uh, maybe advertise a result of mine, but let me instead tell you about um, Uh, let me briefly say uh, what the problem with this question is. So there is um, a theorem um, due to uh, myself Yasulaga and Kuno Sapilainen. It says um, Suppose F is F has two atoms or one atom at zero, zero. then the limit in star does not exist. So that's the obstruction to um, answering this question. But most people believe, so basically this was a conjecture to show that even for Bernoulli weights, if you if the Bernoulli weights are supported on A comma B instead of zero comma one, where A is bigger than zero and B is bigger than zero, then this, uh, then this uh, limit exists in some sense. I'm, I'm speaking loosely, it's uh, not precisely. Um, that was a conjecture due to Steele and Zhang in the early 2000s. So we showed that this conjecture was false. I'm not telling you the statement of the conjecture, um, but uh, that shows you that somehow there's some clear obstruction to weights with atoms having um, uh, asymptotic geode geodesic length. So I personally think it's quite a hard question. I don't know how to solve it. It's a good question. So, um, if um, it has two atoms, and what it means is that 
frequently the geodesic is going from say 0 to some far away point n x. Frequently it will encounter points where these two paths, these two sections gamma 1 and gamma 2 have the same weight T gamma 1 equals T gamma 2. So T gamma 1 equals T gamma 2 and so on. It will encounter it often enough. So it encounters these detours often enough. So this means that say this path, which is clearly longer with the detours, is a geodesic. And this path, which is clearly shorter, is also a geodesic. So it's a non-uniqueness type result. But you can still ask even in this case, so it's not a full resolution. So that's I was hiding all of that under the carpet. So for example, you could ask, does limit n going to infinity of geo upper 0 nx divided by n exists? The geodesic with the maximum number of weights, does that have an asymptotic uh, growth rate open. I don't know. So, there is no subadditivity for geodesics. <laughs> in that picture over there, uh, what you are saying is it's some fixed aspect ratio rectangle copies of it are coming or fixed size? What are, what are these? So, these rectangles, uh, so the the, the method of proof says that uh, the geodesic from 0 to nx at least say some one half times n times will encounter uh, uh, rectangles like this. So it's very random and you can you can make constructions that show that you will encounter these rectangles. Uh, around uh, say 0 to infinite x, I draw a neighborhood. It keeps on having the excursions outside, uh, uh, outside any neighborhood like this. So Nishant's asking, what what do these geodesics look like? Do they are they confined to neighborhoods, but or do they have these big excursions? Um, you, if you mean what are its transversal fluctuations, mm -hmm. I'm coming to that next. Okay, so now I'll return again to this um, KPZ picture and talk about geodesic wandering. So, so basically, if tau e equals 1, then we know mu is the L1 ball, this is b. But we know for the L1 norm, there are many geodesics. You can take that path from 0 to x, and you can also go this way from 0 to x. So, the transversal fluctuations of a geodesic can be quite high in this case. It's order x. So, let's say transversal fluctuations are order x. And I'll define loosely what trans transversal fluctuations mean. It's basically the maximal displacement of, of the geodesic um, from the straight line joining zero. So, the, the question is if tau e is a small perturbation of 1, of the atom 1, the atomic distribution 1, so delta 1, then um, do geodesics have, uh, have little l1 type behavior? So most people believe that the answer to this is no, and 
uh, believe that in general that geodesics are quite close to straight lines. Are quite close. To straight lines. In fact, transversal fluctuations are little lower as x goes to infinity. Uh, so, if I have a sequence of distribution to delta 1, you expect that you don't have any continuity, I guess. So, if they are indeed close to straight lines, then you still have, you know. Yeah. Uh, so, Nishant asks, uh, is there any uh, continuity in these um, transversal fluctuations? Um, I guess. This, this, this sort of intuition seems to indicate that there shouldn't be any continuity. Okay, so somehow this behavior of geodesics, these transversal fluctuations. So let me let me establish some notation. So I will say d zero x is the uh, perpendicular. Perpendicular maximal perpendicular displacement of the geodesic from the line straight line joining zero and x. So this somehow is related to related to the curvature of the time constant or the strict convexity okay. by curvature i mean so you look at this ball b then i look at a hyperplane and I focus on a hyperplane close to this point X, then um, in this direction U, uh, mu should be quadratic, is the idea of the curvature. Okay, so this is fairly standard motion. Okay, so why should this be related to the curvature or strict convexity of mu? We believe that um, we believe that these things should be true. Things should be true, but we have no proof. These are among the biggest open problems in this field. Sorry, what do you believe to be true? Yes. Curvature, we believe curvature is true, and we believe or the weaker notion of strict convexity is also true. No, but what do you mean? I mean, the strict curvature or something is, what is curvature is true, I mean, it has turn of flat points, is what you are saying. Uh, yes, but. Um, and that, does that say that d0 x is little of x? Is that what I mean? What is. Um, I'll define it precisely. Oh, okay. Yeah, that's the curvature of, of the of the limit shape. So, but um, I, I just wanted to write a statement uh, in case, but I can also explain it like this. Um, so, you know, uh, I want more or less uh, mu of say this is this is my shape. Uh, mu less than or equal to one. Mu of x less than or equal to one. I fix some direction, say, uh, 
say uh, theta and this is my hyperplane uh, that's tangent to theta and then this is some displacement in this direction or in the hyperplane then I would say mu of theta plus u uh, minus mu u would be like c u squared in some sense or a small, a small u. And so you can also define some curvature exponent and say it doesn't have to be what that is. Okay, so why should why should this uh, behavior of geodesics be related to this curvature? I can give you a heuristic. So, um, so suppose I'm going from the point zero comma zero to n comma n. Okay. And one strategy could be to take the geodesic from zero uh, comma n to n comma zero. Let's call that gamma one, and then take the geodesic from um, n comma zero to n comma n. So the time for t gamma one plus t gamma two would be approximately n mu e one big uh, uh, plus n mu e two, right? Just by the time constant here. So this I'll write as n mu e one plus mu e two. So by strict convexity, this would be um, much bigger than n times mu e1 plus e2. So this sort of indicates that um, these sort of large excursion strategies, strategies are very suboptimal. Um, if mu is strictly convex. Okay. This heuristic uh, cannot be made into a proof. So that would be my question. True, because it's only one strategy. There are many, many strategies to produce these large, large uh, these paths that deviate significantly from the straight line. You can prove it if you assume that um, uh, this shape is uniformly curved, for example, but not in this case. So prove, for example, that d zero n x divided by n. Um, without assuming anything, without hypothesizing unknowns, is equal to zero. Uh, you can assume anything you want about the distribution, but henceforth we will uh, consider only distributions that are uh, continuous. Okay. Absolutely continuous with respect to the big mesh. So, in the KPC scaling, however, in this physics predictions, much more refined things are supposed to be true. So we expect in general that d0 nx should go as n to the c. These are heuristics. I mean, these heuristics are physics heuristics, so uh, I don't understand them very well. So c is supposed to be 2 thirds in d equals 2. 
and this is unknown for d bigger than two. Uh, there are simulations that sort of indicate what it's true, but there are no theoretical predict predictions even on the physics level to indicate what these uh, things should be. So I think I asked you a similar question earlier. Uh, whenever someone says basically, they always talk about d equal to 2 and then they also mention matrices. For so, uh, d bigger than 2, is there any kind of, you know, so like exponent uh, or any such uh, that fluctuations would be of order the I don't know any result of this kind. Uh, yeah, in in so Nishantas, uh, what do we know about d bigger strictly bigger than two? Are there any predictions? Is you know, is there any interesting theory or anything like that? It's, all of that's unknown as far as I know. We have there are certainly numerical simulations in 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 JSP, for example, and Physicists know a lot. In high dimensions, they know the growth of surfaces. For example, they know height fluctuations are in three dimensions, are like long. So, this we also know for, uh, say, certain height functions, I guess. Or the infinite fraction. Sorry? We know this for certain height functions. Uh, ah, so, know. certain yeah. random growth, growth things. Yeah. But these are all using the computer. I mean, not. Yeah, yeah. Do, uh, like, uh, uh, my question was, do you even expect this to be polynomial? Uh, like, this, this is, uh, uh, okay, so let me uh, uh, mention these things for the online audience. Um, Alvin says that uh, there are predictions using conformal field theory in D equals 3 that predict like logarithmic growth or things like that. Um, I don't know about these and one example, if you take D to be very, very high, uh, then there are these high models where you know, the fluctuations are constant. So, the fluctuations are constant. But, you know, that doesn't say anything uh, about what happens under the expert. Yeah, in those cases... No, I don't think that so, there's any human So, um, Nishan says, as, as D goes to infinity, more things are known. Yes, certainly. So. The lattice becomes most tree like, there are lace expansions, this and that, so the same thing. Okay. Even in three dimensions, you think uh, some low temperature, high temperature difference is there? Do they have predictions at all? This is one end of it, right? I mean, the last there is a polymer, polymer model. There is, uh, you remember? Oh. If you remember reading, is that uh, these are uh, these are not equilibrium models. I mean, these are not, uh, these are just. Uh, I don't think there is any phase transition. So, so, so the model I was talking about is the the height changes by plus minus one on all the edges, uh, and you uh, condition on zero on the on the number. You want one point. You condition the height being zero on the boundary of a magnitude of a big uh, of on some uh, box, I guess. And then you look at and uh, the change of the height can be plus minus one on the edges. Mm -hmm. And then you look at the fluctuations of the origin. And this is the homogeneous angle. So Nishant is mentioning some model where some things are known. I'm not sure how much this has to do with uh, last passage. Probably not very much. When are we supposed to break? At 3. Uh, I started 10 minutes late. Uh, yeah, hopefully it's there. Uh, um, let, me, let me check where I am. Um, Yeah, it'll, it'll take a bit longer for me. So. Okay. Uh, yeah, it's a good time to break, and so uh, we'll take a 10 minute break and, and come back. Yeah, there is coffee outside. Right? You want to make 10 minutes or 5? Yeah, coffee is fine. Ten, oh, 5 minutes is 5 minutes. minutes. 